Hello everyone, my name is Sebastian and I'm one of the co-founders of Pima Studios, a app-specific layer 2 for on-chain gaming and gamification. Now why do we need this? In my opinion, there are four main barriers right now to Web3 adoption. The first one is that development is expensive. It can often take over $100,000 to both build your application and get it audited. And especially if your application requires NFTs, this can also cost often over 10,000 in main costs for your NFT. Now, obviously this is prohibitive for entrepreneurs, but even more so for brands that may want to try out to Web3 or NFT projects that are already in the Web3 space and want to expand their brand presence. Now for these NFT projects, they may not have $100,000 to spend on developing an on-chain game, and they can't easily do it themselves because NFT creators are usually artists and not necessarily developers. Now, second part is that Web3 is risky. We've seen over $3 billion in hacks in 2022 alone. This is really scary for large brands who are considering bringing their IP to Web3 because if they bring their intellectual property over to a Web3 environment and it gets hacked, this could be a huge brand risk or brand reputation damage uh, for them. It's, this is also true of NFT projects. One of the main reasons a lot of NFT projects are not building on-chain games, even though it seems like a right fit, is because if that game that gets built uh, gets hacked, this could spell the end of their NFT project. Third one is that user acquisition is difficult. We all know that a lot of dApps out there do not have that many users, and that's because the Web3 user space is split into over thousands of chains, each with its own community, and it's really hard to target all this, uh, all the all these users all at once. And so Pima will help facilitate this by making it easier to target the entirety of the Web3 space instead of just a specific community. Fourth one is that iteration is really difficult. So right now, um, oftentimes when you're developing a smart contract, you only have one shot of getting it right. Oftentimes, if you want to iterate and update your smart contract, you need to go through a audit again, which is very expensive. And especially for games, it's oftentimes impossible to update these because if you already gave NFTs to users, you already gave them the items, you already gave them the equipment, it's almost impossible to take it back from them to uh, perhaps rebalance the system. And so just iteration is also a very hard problem, but this is bad because games require fast iteration. The way to build a successful game is to be able to iterate every week and add new features based off um, user requests and keep them engaged in your game. So how are we tackling this at Pima Studios and with Pima Engine? Well, first of all, we made development a lot easier. So we enable creating these layer twos, creating these games using web two skills. So you can use JavaScript, you can connect with um, Unity, with GameMaker, with all these popular uh, Web2 frameworks to easily create your game without having to learn a Web3 programming language like Solidity. And despite this, we allow deploying your game to all the top EVM chains, such as Ethereum, Polygon, BNB Chain, and Milkamita, which means that you can deploy to existing communities uh, without having to learn um, Solidity and just uh, basic Web3 knowledge of NFTs and, and that kind of stuff is good enough. An example of this is that somebody built a on-chain chess game during a hackathon in less than a week. So if you're trying to do this using Solidity or another Web3 skill, this could often take a lot of time and be really expensive. But this version of on-chain chess was built with Pima in just a few days. It has a built-in matchmaking system as well as the entire chess game lives on-chain. Now obviously this is you know kind of a toy example, but it really shows how much faster you can develop with Pima Engine, even if you're a seasoned Web3 developer. The other thing we do is that we make Pima much safer. So oftentimes when you're interacting with layer twos or games right now, you have to temporarily give up custody of your assets. You first put your funds in a smart contract, interact with the application, and then bring your funds back to your wallet at the end. Now this introduces a period of risk where if the game or application gets hacked, during that time, you may lose all your funds. The way we've built Pima is as a non-custodial layer two, a non-custodial application. So that means that if you want to use an application that's powered by Pima, you never have to give up custody of your funds. Instead, you send data to layer two, 
you send data to the game, it updates it, and then that update gets reflected back on the NFT that you own on the layer, layer one. Now, this is powered by Prime Engine, which you can think of it kind of like an NFT compression protocol in a sense. That is to say, oftentimes for on-chain games, you need a lot of NFTs. You need items, you need characters, you need maps, and this costs a lot of min costs. And as I mentioned, this is hard to iterate, uh, uh, iterate on. So what we enable doing is, for example, sending only a single NFT per user. Then this NFT represents their account. And then the content of that account is stored on the layer two. So their, uh, their wins, their losses, their items, their history, all stored on the layer two and associated back to their layer one NFT. This enables the layer one NFT to evolve over time dynamically based on user actions on the layer two, which is really what you want for gaming uh, without having to um, ever give up custody of your, of your funds. And we call the system staple NFTs. And these staple NFTs are the combination of the user layer one NFT and the layer two state. Now, some of you may not be as familiar with layer two, so I just want to give kind of a picture of how this works. So on the layer one side, you have, you know, Ethereum, Polygon, uh, any of these uh, changes, Milk Mita, any, as long as it's EVM, it's fine. And uh, layer twos are basically a technology to add new execution environments to existing projects. So Arbitrum is an EVM on EVM, uh, Starknet enables Cairo on EVM, and Pyma enables you to have layer twos uh, they're app specific. So every game, every app gets its own layer two. Now we also want to make acqu uh, user acquisition easy. And we do this with a framework, an SDK called Pima Whirlpool, which facilitates user adoption. It supports all the key features you want to build a game, such as the ability to subsidize free transactions for specified users. We enabled also something similar to account abstraction to enable cross chain gameplay. Notably, a lot of games right now to go cross chain, they redeploy their game to multiple ecosystems. This is bad, especially for online games, because it means it fractures your entire uh, user base into many small segments. Instead, we support deploying once and supporting users from many chains using something like account abstraction that gives you cross wallet support. Notably, we support already uh, six of the top seven NFT chains which means you can already target the majority of the NFT uh, market uh, using Pima. A case study of this is a game called Jungle Wars. That was the first public game written using Pima Engine. That's kind of like a turn-based battleship game. And to play this game, you do not need an estate for NFT. You can play without it. But if you want your wins, your losses, the characters you unlock, and uh, to be tracked on chain, if you want to show up on the on-chain leaderboard, you need to buy the stateful NFT on the layer one. These NFTs cost about $4 with an infinite supply. So it's guaranteed uh, never to go up in price. And yet uh, we actually sold over 1,600 of them, which shows that there are a lot of users who are willing to pay a small amount of money to have their app tracked on chain and feel ownership of their in-game progress. So we added Pymar Whirlpool for this application to allow, for example, targeting users on Polkadot, as well as Cardano, two other large communities. And you can see from the graph right here that after our initial EVM release, adding the Polkadot wallet support and adding the Cardano wallet support as well, uh, brought a increased traffic, increased amount of users, which really shows that if you target multiple communities, you actually gain more users uh, from doing this. And as I mentioned, uh, we also sold over 1,600 of these you know, optional NFTs for the game itself. Now, the last part I want to talk about is iteration. We want to make iteration easy for these games as that's so important for uh, being able to stay competitive. The reason why a lot of games right now can't iterate quickly is as I mentioned, not only the audit costs, um, the games often overcommit with too many NFTs with too much static data. For example, they mint on the layer one, a thousand swords. And later on, if they decide that they want to change the way these swords work, it's very hard to update these NFTs because they've already given up permission of them. And these, off these NFTs often have static data built in. Second of all, with, with respect to Solidity, not only is the audit expensive every time you need to make an audit, uh, skipping the audit is not really an option. 
because if you want to avoid having an audit every time you change your smart contract, uh, then you're opening yourself up to potentially getting hacked, uh, which brings back the brand risk into question. So notably, the way historical Web3 games work was to maximize the amount of NFTs as possible. Now, this does have an upside, which is maximum cross-app compatibility. Any other application on layer 1 can see these NFTs and interact with them. However, the downside is that this brings a high mint cost, as well as making them hard to update. And I think for a lot of cases, this cross-app compatibility is not actually required. You know, for a game, you usually want to have stuff be iterable as fast as possible. And only once you know that this idea is really taken off, that users love this idea, then you really want to commit to it. So that's why for Pima, we instead flipped it around. So instead, so you should minimize the number of NFTs, minimize the amount of static data that you have, because the fewer NFTs you have, the cheaper it is and the more flexible it is. So as I mentioned, there's this common pattern of single NFT per user. So you can think of this as like a next generation of NFT development. So we first had standard NFTs that couldn't be updated. Then we had dynamic NFTs where some parts that are predefined in the contract state could be updated. And now we have staple NFTs where the entire NFT, ta NFT state is fully updatable. And of course, um, updating NFTs is great, but we also want to enable updating the game itself. So Pima works as kind of a way to turn state machines into um, layer twos. And so what we enable you to do is, is schedule updates for your game at specific block numbers. So you could say, okay, after block number a thousand, my layer two will update to this new state machine, this new version of the game, new version of the application, and um, still uh, be able to do this in a way that, that all just works. And the great thing about Pima being non-custodial, as I mentioned uh, before, is that it also helps actually make this iteration faster because it means that if you introduce a new version and it introduces a bug, it's not as big of a deal because it's not custodial user funds are not at risk and you can submit an update later that just fixes the issue. The reason we have all this flexibility, for example, for making iteration easier is because unlike some other solutions, such as Optimism, where every game shares the same layer two, shares the same sequencer set, in Pima, every game, every application gets its own layer two, which can have its own uh, you know, programming language, can be JavaScript and so on, and can also have its own sequencer set, which can power this account abstraction framework and can empower these update mechanisms. So that's the flexibility of Pima. We've launched a developer preview fairly recently, about a month uh, before this video has gone live. We already have double digit number of projects that have signed up to use Pima. Some of these are games. Uh, some of these are NFT projects that want to go into gamification. Some of these are just purely, uh, you know, Web3 gamification use cases like identity, traceability, um, point systems, um, user loyalty tracking systems, like a whole uh, wide variety of use cases have already reached out to us and some of them have already started building out their solution. So if this sounds interesting to you, I have my email as well as my Calendly link uh, down below and definitely reach out to us. We'd love to work with you. Pima not only has a lot of projects working on, on it already, we also have a rich B2B ecosystem. So if you need help with development, you need help with marketing, you need help with RPC providers, we have a rich ecosystem of companies uh, providing these B2B solutions in the Pima ecosystem are more, more than happy to connect you to bring your vision to life.